October 4th, 1980, there was a, a young nursing student that was uh, brutally uh, raped and murdered uh, in a Chicago suburb. Uh, there was a, a young Christian Bible college student that lived in the area named Stephen Linscombe. Uh, he was attending uh, Emmaus Bible College. Uh, he uh, actually, uh, at the uh, encouragement of a friend, went to the police to say on the night of the attack, it was interesting to him, that he actually had a dream, a horrific dream, of a woman being attacked. Uh, and there were some similarities between the crime and his dream. And uh, his friend thought maybe that would be of interest to the police. He reported it to them, and they took it as a confession. Uh, they arrested him. DNA evidence in 1980 isn't quite what it was today. Uh, and just simply because uh, some of his hair was similar to, similar, not DNA, just similar to hair fibers, found uh, on the scene, uh, he was convicted uh, and sentenced to 40 years in prison, completely innocent. He, see, he remained in prison for three and a half years uh, before uh, being released on appeal, and it took him about another nine to finally, through DNA evidence, finally caught up with, uh, with things in terms of the technology and, uh, and proved his uh, complete uh, innocence. Uh, that's, that's where we've got the Apostle Paul today. He's been in prison for two years, I'm sure Paul is trusting the Lord, believing that God's had a plan. But uh, uh, you think about how much Paul could have done in two years in preaching the gospel. How many churches he could have planted. How many people he could have uh, led, uh, led to the Lord. And I'm sure there had to be a, a few sleepless nights where he was kind of wondering, okay, you've got me here for a reason, but maybe we should be moving on with this and, uh, and not still stuck here in Caesarea Maritima. Before we move on with Paul, let me just quote Stephen Linscombe after his ordeal of 12 years. He said, quote, I've come to realize that we cannot judge God's purposes, nor where he places us, nor why he chooses one path for our lives as opposed to another. We just don't know. And, uh, and a lot of times, of course, that's the most difficult part is that, uh, is that not, uh, not knowing. Uh, for a Christian, that's a long time to wait. Uh, in prison, that's a long time to have your name cleared. But uh, certainly have the examples in the Bible of men like Job, men like Joseph. And um, on a, a greater level, it may have made no sense at all to some at the time that God would send his own son to die on a Roman cross. Uh, and yet that was God's perfect plan for our salvation. Sometimes from our limited perspective, what God is doing doesn't always make sense. Uh, and Paul may have had some of those thoughts in his own mind, but I believe he was still trusting and, uh, and, uh, and trusting the promises of God. Falsely accused, uh, again, the original charge, uh, he brought a Gentile into the temple. Uh, he had uh, an opportunity as he was about ready to be physically torn apart uh, because of Claudius Lysias, the commander of the Antonio Fortress, came down with a couple hundred guys and rescued him. Uh, he spoke to him in Greek. He recognized that uh, Paul was not the man that he thought he was, allowed him to speak, and he had his one shot at preaching the gospel. He had an opportunity before the Sanhedrin, but uh, by the time uh, he barely opened his mouth, he was slapped in the face and then basically said to the high priest very quickly, again, my, uh, my translation is, I don't even recognize that you're the high priest. Because, uh, again, and, and you'll, you'll continue to see this morning why we say historically Judaism was at its, its lowest point during the first century in terms of where it was spiritually, morally, and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and Paul did not recognize their authority. Uh, there's a plot against him. Uh, and remember, it took almost 500 guys to get him out of town uh, and get him to Caesarea Maritima. And we showed you some, some pictures of, uh, of what uh, that area looks like there on the Mediterranean just north of Tel Aviv. He stands before one trial before Felix. Felix is a brutal, immortal man, eventually recalled to Rome because he had so many problems there. Uh, his the way of dealing with the, with the riot was just to go out and kill everybody and then crucify the leaders and say, probably won't want to do this again. And uh, that's the man Paul stood before. He called Paul back again to hear him once again. And that's what we looked at last time. Paul gave him a pretty good three-point message righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. We talked about how, how Felix literally shook uh, with fear and with terror. God's spirit upon him. Conviction, but no decision to, uh, uh, to walk with the Lord, to repent of his sins. Uh, he's been recalled, uh, and we're going to be introduced to Festus. He is the new 
uh, governor, the new procurator over uh, this part of uh, the Roman Empire. Well, let's take a look at the first 12 verses where we'll see that Paul is compelled to make a formal request. That request would be to uh, stand before Caesar in Rome. Verse 1. Now when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed it against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem, while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea, and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. And when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me according to these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. I've got three reasons why Paul uh, makes this great pronouncement. We'll talk about the, the particulars of, um, and the criteria for making an appeal like this and really what it meant here in a moment. But again, the first reason is Paul's compelled to make the request because there's a new governor, Festus, verse 9, but Festus wanting to do the Jews a favor. He's a new guy on the scene. He's on the job three days, and he goes to Jerusalem to confer with these guys. Uh, they go, yeah, well, there was this little matter we want to bring up about this uh, prisoner you've got there uh, in your palace uh, there at the uh, Hotel Caesarea, uh, and we'd like him brought back down here because it's just a religious deal, and it's a religious question, and Festus doesn't know anything about Judaism, the law of Moses, or, uh, or anything else. What he does know is the guy before him was a brutal guy and got replaced because the way he dealt with the Jews. Uh, he needs to kind of win them over here a little bit, so, so he's not replaced right away. Uh, the Jewish leadership know that, they understand that, and so there's a little, there's a little advantage here they have uh, with this uh, Roman, uh, Roman leader. Now, uh, uh, his Facebook page is really old, and that was the best <laughs> image I could get off of it, but uh, uh, that is Festus. Uh, unlike Felix, uh, he's not a brutal guy. He's not an immoral guy. Apparently, he's a very good administrator. He likes gets things done, ties up loose ends uh, uh, very quickly. And they brought him uh, into Judea uh, to replace Felix for that uh, very reason, the fact that he had that particular skill set. Again, the Jews wanting to take advantage of that, present their charges against, uh, against Paul. Uh, notice verse 3, uh, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem. Uh, it's a kind of an interesting term there that we kind of miss in English, asking a favor, asking by grace. <laughs> this is kind of a, uh, most, most Jewish leaders in the first century, when they talked to a Roman official, didn't say, oh, kind sir, may you, by your grace, please grant our request. These guys hated each other. Uh, they didn't get along at all. Uh, it's, uh, it's the idea, it's said with a, a certain amount of humility. Of course, it's false humility on these guys' part. Uh, but they're, uh, they're giving it their best shot to try to get the Apostle Paul back and take advantage of the fact there's a new, there's a new guy in town. And let's see if we can uh, get him to send Paul back here to Jerusalem, which leads to second, uh, the second reason Paul was compelled to uh, appeal to Caesar is the plot to, to kill him, to assassinate him. That's in verse 3, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. Uh, did Paul know about the ambush? Maybe, maybe not. Either way, he knows these guys don't want to kill him. Uh, there's a, uh, they have not uh, made any secret about that at all. He knows it would be very dangerous. Again, it took, what it was, 492 guys to get him safely out of Jerusalem. Uh, I, he's uh, probably doubting there'll be that many 
uh, armed guards that will get him back into the city uh, safely. He had to fear uh, for his life. Uh, again, God wanted Paul kept safe. Uh, notice uh, verse 4, but F F uh, uh, Festus answered Paul uh, should be kept at Caesarea. Uh, and that's odd. That's unusual. Uh, he's there. He's the new guy on the job. He's there three days. He goes to Jerusalem. Hey, we just got a simple request. We want to bring this guy down to Jerusalem. And it's like if his point in going is to kind of win them over and try to cooperate with them uh, the best uh, that he can. They make one simple request. It says, no, I'm not doing that. So it's just, it's just kind of strange. Uh, but even in that, that little line, we see God's sovereignty. God is not going to let a man like Festus or Felix or anybody else get Paul back to Jerusalem where he's going to be executed. That's not God's will for Paul's life. It's to get him before kings. We're going to meet one of those in just a moment. And eventually to Caesar Nero uh, himself. Again, unjustly accused. Uh, no reason to return again. Festus wants to gain favor. There's a humble <laughs> with the, by, by your grace, uh, but he, uh, he turns it down. Uh, we also see the quickness that Festus deals with the issue. Verse 1, as I mentioned, after three days, he goes right down. Verse 6, after spending eight to ten days in Jerusalem, he returns to Caesarea, and boom, immediately uh, uh, he is at uh, the judgment seat. That's our term, bima. We think about the bima seat. Now, all of us will stand before one day in terms of Jesus Christ, uh, but that is the term that's used here, uh, and I'll show you a, a picture of one here just in a moment. Uh, notice that there are now many charges. We've gone from one, bringing a Gentile into the court, which of course was not true, uh, and those charges have now over the two years multiplied. Verse 7, when he had come, the Jews had come down from Jerusalem, stood about and laid, notice, many serious complaints against Paul, which they, of course, could not prove. One charge to uh, many. Uh, by the response of Paul, at least they're summarized in three categories in verse 8. Uh, Paul says, neither against the law of the Jews, the Mosaic law, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. So those are the, uh, whatever the serious charges were, they fell into uh, one of those three categories. Had Paul ever done anything against the law? No, no, he hadn't. He's a Pharisee. Uh, has he done anything against the temple? No, he was in there carrying out purification rites at the time that uh, he was arrested. Has he done anything against Caesar? He's kind of hoping he'll see him. <laughs> no, he hasn't done anything uh, against him. Uh, reason number three, Paul's compelled to make the formal request, uh, is because while Festus, as this thing progresses, makes the request uh, to send him to Jerusalem. Uh, again, Paul is uh, uh, asked to return, and Festus uh, is in a dilemma, and that's why he asks. Uh, he really can't demand. Paul's a Roman citizen. It was against Roman law for a judge to send him to another court. Uh, he's got to have permission to do that, so he asked Paul's permission. Uh, and he, he's in a dilemma. Uh, if Paul is, uh, is uh, convicted of false charges uh, and, uh, and Rome finds out about that, you allowed a Roman citizen to be convicted and killed by these guys? Well, he's in a lot of trouble. He may face death himself. Uh, but if he doesn't send them down, then he's got problems with uh, the Jewish leaders in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, if he lets Paul go, Paul may be executed on the way and assassinated. Uh, and again, as a Roman official, he's not supposed to have anything to do with religious affairs. So he's got a real dilemma to send him uh, uh, or not to send him. He's kind of between a rock and a hard place. And so he cannot just order Paul down there. So he just simply makes the request. All these three reasons lead to Paul then in this pronouncement to appeal to Caesar. Uh, again, the idea here, since 27 BC, it's been Augustus Caesar, Augustus, the one to be worshipped. Uh, again, we move from, from the, uh, uh, the Republic of the Roman Empire, uh, Romans uh, government to the empire, and, uh, uh, and at this point, the Caesar is to be worshipped. He's the one to be worshipped. He's Augustus Caesar. Therefore, he's the one that had all the wisdom. He's the one that could solve all the hard and difficult cases. Uh, and so Paul makes the appeal to the one to be worshipped, the one that would know how to handle this dispute. Now, you couldn't make the appeal. Of course, one, uh, the, you, you've got to be a free Roman citizen to make the appeal. 
two uh, in order to do it. It's got to be a case that's in dispute. In other words, you steal something, you get caught. Well, I'd like to appeal to Caesar. Well, that's not happening, buddy. We got the evidence. You're going to jail right now. So it's got to be a case they can't deal with. There's not enough evidence. It fits Paul's uh, case. Uh, Festus can't even figure out what to charge him with yet. Uh, and so when Paul, Paul knows, he knows the Roman law, and he knows that his case fits the criteria, he can appeal uh, to, to Rome. Uh, the problem is, uh, once you appeal to Rome, it doesn't mean that you're going to see the Caesar. Uh, that's, that's no automatic. There were, there were people that were set up in territories as his representatives, and that's who you saw. Not everybody got to see the Caesar just because you made the uh, appeal. And, but uh, if you wanted to see him, what you needed to do is have some money because you needed to bribe that guy to see that guy, and you needed to bribe that guy to see that guy, and, bribe that, and then maybe you would see Caesar. Paul's problem is he has no money, and he's not going to be bribing uh, anyone. So how is it that once he makes his appeal to see Caesar, he actually sees him? Well, you're going to be introduced to those two reasons. That's uh, King Agrippa and Bernice in just a, uh, just a minute. But he's taking a chance, and even in that, uh, again, God's sovereignty is, uh, is in all of that. Paul's taking a chance, therefore. He hasn't met Agrippa. He hasn't met Bernice yet. Uh, if, although he may, um, certainly he knows about them, uh, but he's going to meet them. He's going to have an opportunity to share his whole testimony to them, uh, and they are well connected with uh, with Caesar Nero. That's how he gets there, not because he's uh, got a bribe in any way, but that's his risk in doing this. He says, "I appeal to Caesar could have meant I'm now going to sit in jail for another five or six or seven or eight years, and my case may never be heard, and I'll sit there because I have no money to bribe anybody." So there's kind of a risk involved here, but obviously Paul felt like that's what the Lord would have him to do. God says, I'm taking you to Rome. Uh, to Rome, you're going to go. You're going to stand before kings. Pretty sure that guy fits the criteria of king in terms of uh, Caesar Nero. So God was, I think, directing the whole appeal process. I think it's God that puts it on the apostle Paul's, Paul's heart to, to make this decision. Uh, and I think he does it so that he can witness to, uh, to Caesar. Again, Nero takes the throne 54 AD uh, to 60 AD. That won't be on the final. Let's just kind of give us a criteria. We're right around 60 AD uh, at this time because Paul's been there for a couple of years. Uh, and it would be Nero that would hear his case. Nero's good friends, King Agrippa and Bernice, are about to meet the Paul, uh, Apostle Paul, as I said, hear his entire testimony. Uh, and I think that's what really pays the way to get Paul all the way in front of uh, Nero. Now, that happens, and did Nero get saved? No, of course he didn't, but his wife did, his mother-in-law did, other members of his household did. Uh, we know that by historical fact, as well as by the fact that Paul mentions them in, in one of his letters. Uh, the price for that, they were tortured by Nero and martyred for their faith uh, as a result. But Paul does get there. God does have a plan, and it is going to be worked out. Paul's been sitting there for two years, and in two years, he could have been thinking about the number of churches he could have planted, the number of people he could love to the Lord. And, uh, and on a certain level, it doesn't make sense to have, have what may be the greatest Christian and the greatest evangelist that has ever lived on the planet and have him sit in a prison for two years in our economy of, of things. But under God's economy thing, this makes all the sense in the world. He's got a reason and he's got a plan. I think Paul is trusting, believing God's promises. Uh, it doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make it easy for us. Uh, even when we're attempting to trust and believe and wait and, uh, uh, on God and on God's timing. Uh, but he does have his reasons. So Paul's compelled to make a formal request. And we've looked at three reasons. Uh, and then part of it, as I mentioned, this includes the... This lovely couple, he's about ready to, uh, to meet here. Paul's legal case, secondly, is introduced to Agrippa, verse 13 to 21. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left uh, a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him, to them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accuser face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself 
concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I suppose, but had some questions about him and about their religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, who Paul affirmed to be alive. I used to get a sense he probably preached the gospel <laughs> during that time period. Verse 20, and because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. So uh, again, Festus is the, the new guy in the job. He's only, a, he's only in Caesarea three days. He goes to Jerusalem. He's there a week and a half or so. He's back. Boom, he has court the next day. Now he's got a dilemma with uh, Paul, what to do with him. Awesome. Now I have a state visit by the king and the queen. Uh, but this is uh, no ordinary uh, couple here. And so we'd say first, this case would be interesting uh, because of King Agrippa and his family background. This is King Agrippa uh, II. He is the great grandson of Herod the Great. Herod who built the temple, uh, great because he was a great builder. One of the things you see in Israel today uh, is the archeological remains of, uh, of this guy's building all over the country, which it, it is amazing and it is breathtaking, but he was a brutal man. It was said in, in the first century, it was safer to be, uh, be Herod's pig than it was his son. Because anybody he felt a jealousy towards, he had them uh, executed. He was a horrific uh, uh, individual historically. This is uh, our guy in the story. This is his great grandfather. Uh, it also means that he's Jewish. He's an idiomite, but he's still Jewish. He practices, uh, he and Bernice practice all the Jewish festivals. They keep all the rituals. They keep all the traditionals, traditions, but they live completely immoral lives. We'll talk about how immoral just in a, uh, in a moment. They are the head of uh, Jewish religion uh, in the first century. Uh, they are the keepers uh, and the determiners of who the high priest would be. They kept all the high priest garments. It was their possessions. They gave it to the high priest when he would serve in the temple on the day of Yom Kippur and uh, the other times that he needed that elaborate uh, garment on. His father, uh, we met uh, back in chapter 12, King Agrippa I. Uh, when our guy Agrippa is 16 years old, he would have watched his father persecute and kill Christians. He would have watched his father chop the head off the apostle James. Uh, he would have watched his father put Peter in prison, uh, and he would have watched his father stricken by God and die in Caesarea, the very place he's at. He's about ready to hold court, and there's a little meaning for it, and we find that in Acts chapter 12, where it says in verse 20, now Herod, this is the dad, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a said day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an or oration uh, to them. And the people kept shouting the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. And Josephus writes about this. By the way, he's a good friend of Herod, this uh, Herod Agrippa, and he's a very good friend of Bernice. They all know each other, they're all Jewish, and they've all sold out to, uh, to the Romans, uh, and, uh, and Josephus writes uh, quite a bit about them. And on this occasion, when the father was stricken by God, uh, and then basically eaten by worms and died within a, a very short period of time. Uh, that's the dad, he's 16 year old when it happens. He's held back in Rome, and basically for a few years, uh, by Claudius, who's the emperor at the time, and then he sends him out, gives him a little place in northern Galilee to, to rule over. He's being groomed to uh, take his, uh, his, father's, uh, his father's place. Uh, Bernice is kind of at his side uh, for a period of time. Uh, and again, I'll spare you some of the details, but she goes off and marries an uncle over here for a while who's ruling something, doesn't like that, so she moves over here. By the way, she's considered the most beautiful woman in the Roman Empire. And uh, we met her sister last week, Drusilla, who apparently was very beautiful as well. She is constantly being 
drawn by other men in relationships uh, for the sake of politics, power, uh, and money, and her life continues that way. Let me show you a little uh, family tree here. I don't know if you can see the whole thing, but uh, uh, at the top you have Herod the Great, and then you have Herodias, and you see the line drowned uh, coming down to uh, Herod Agrippa I, the guy that dies in Acts chapter 12. The point here is who are their kids? Bernice, Agrippa, our guy in the story, Felix, uh, and then Drusilla. We met Drusilla last week, and yes, that means that Bernice and Agrippa are actually brothers and sisters. So when they come together, after she's kind of Don Johnson, been with other guys, she comes back to her brothers again uh, and lives with him, married in an incestuous relationship, just thrilled the Jewish people, of course. This is who their religious leaders uh, of Judaism in the first century is, who determines the next high priest and so forth. Uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite the family. Uh, Bernice, of course, is, uh, isn't done. Uh, later, she becomes the mistress of Emperor Vespasian, who orders the destruction of the Jewish people in 70 AD. But oh, by the way, when he's out of town, she has a, an affair uh, later with his son Titus, who actually carried out uh, uh, that destruction of the temple. But they're Jewish. Uh, so this is a, a very immoral king and queen that Paul is going to stand trial uh, before. Again, Rome is given, uh, Rome is given here to grip of the second, second legal jurisdiction over the temple. So again, to Festus, this makes all the sense in the world. I don't know anything about Judaism. These charges seem to be something with the law of the Jews uh, and the temple itself. Uh, how about you hear what he has to say? And of course, we're going to see that Agrippa is more than interested. He knows all about the Apostle Paul. He knows all about Christianity. He knows all the claims of Jesus Christ. He's grown up with it. He's seen it. He's about 31 years old uh, of this period of time. Paul's compelled to make a formal request. And there's some pretty good reasons for him doing it. Uh, it was taking a risk in a sense. We might say it was a request by faith. He had to be trusting God would actually get his case to, uh, to Caesar Nero. There were no guarantees of that. He had no money to bribe anyone. Uh, there's a legal case. It's going to be introduced to King Agrippa. Uh, and now there's the courtroom opportunity uh, that, uh, that we see in verse 22 to 27. It says there, then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium and the commanders uh, and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here. Uh, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So uh, the courtroom scenes begin, and of course, next time we'll actually get to Paul's testimony. Uh, the lengthiest testimony of Paul that we have in the New Testament is before this lovely couple here. Uh, but notice that the uh, courtroom is uh, on a grand scale, verse 23. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, uh, that word pomp is very interesting. It means uh, a lot of outward show. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, we might, uh, again, outward show with no substance to it. Uh, we might use the word puff you know, as the idea. The Greek word, if you say it into English, it's fantasia. Fantasia. It's like whew, a dazzlement uh, of, uh, of color and spec uh, spectacle and so forth. But no real substance to it. That's what uh, Paul is uh, uh, standing uh, before. And uh, yeah, Paul, Paul did have this one on his Facebook of him there before uh, uh, Agrippa and Drusilla. But uh, it's kind of an older picture. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, but uh, in reality, let's, let's look at an actual beam of seat. Now, uh, we don't have the beam. You can go to the next side. We don't have the beam of seat that was there in Caesarea. But we have the one that's in Corinth. 
And, uh, and that's, that's it right there. Uh, it's, uh, we looked at it earlier when Paul was in Corinth, but uh, it's a very high wall, and they, they sat up very high above it. That's the way the Romans liked it. We just stood before a Roman official, you stood like this, <laughs> and you looked straight up. They just wanted me to remind you, yes, we're the ones up here, and you're the ones way down there. You kind of get you know, who's uh, got the authority here. Uh, they liked it that way. That's how they were uh, built. And this is all part of the, uh, the courtroom scene. Uh, and then last week, uh, we actually showed you at least the archaeological remains uh, of where this whole trial took place there, right on the edge of the Mediterranean, again, just north of uh, uh, modern-day uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, but secondly, Paul's courtroom opportunity came about because uh, Festus has a problem, no legal case before Paul. And uh, kind of admits that uh, here in verse 18, when the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him as such things, I suppose, uh, but had some questions against him about their own religion uh, and about a certain Jesus who had died and Paul affirmed to be alive. Uh, the word for religion is a very interesting word. It's not the typical word that's used in the New Testament. Uh, it actually has a, a, an unusual connotation, meaning cult. He says, you know, they... They, they have this belief system, this cultic idea that there's this guy, Jesus, and he died. Paul swears that he's alive still, that he's uh, risen from the dead. That's what he's saying. And, of course, uh, again, Festus knows nothing about Christianity or Judaism, uh, but certainly uh, Agrippa II uh, does. Uh, he uh, introduces the facts concerning Paul. Uh, it basically says, uh, verse 24, you see that this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me uh, at Jerusalem and here crying out that he's not fit to live any longer. Uh, the problem is, verse 25, I found that he's committed nothing deserving death. Uh, if, if Festus sends him on to Caesar, on to Rome, which he's now compelled to do because Paul met the criteria and makes the request, it's in a court of law when he does that. If he sends them all and the charges are not fitting or are weak or he has no charges, they're going to say, oh, by the way, who sent you and why for this? You send him here. Festus is going to be the next guy on a ship to Rome, and it's not going to be pleasant when he gets there. Uh, you just can't send people through the Roman courts uh, without any legitimate charges if they're Roman citizens. So he's got a real problem. So he's figuring, okay, this is my way out. <laughs> I got this guy here. He's all about Judaism. In fact, he's ahead of it. Uh, he knows all about it. All right, you hear this guy and you figure out some charges for me uh, because you're with me in this whole Roman deal here. So uh, you're my go-between. You come up with some good charges against this guy. I got to have something to write down so I can send him uh, on, on to Rome. And, uh, and again, Paul there uh, faced with groundless uh, accusations. And, uh, but we never see him lose it. Uh, we never see him go on a rampage. We never see him become bitter or cynical at all. In fact, when he gets these uh, opportunities, and we'll, we'll see it next time, it's just like, it was, it's like, it's like I was born for this. <laughs> and, uh, he, is not, uh, he is not intimidated by the pump. He sees it as just that. Uh, man, he, you guys look awesome up there. Beautiful silk, by the way. You know, but it, he's not all about it. It's, it. It doesn't uh, uh, doesn't impress him at all. He's there for one reason, one reason only: to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Shares his whole uh, testimony with, with this couple that he could have been very intimidated intimidated by. It, it, it doesn't always work out when God gives us the opportunities to share our testimonies. It's not always exactly who we figured. I was kind of praying for my aunt, you know, because she doesn't know the Lord. And then, and then it's, uh, you know, some homeless guy standing outside of uh, Burger King. They, that God gives you the opportunity. <laughs> Heard you were a Christian. Well, yeah, but please don't bother me right now. You know, I mean, we, you know, we, it's not always who we think. And um, I, I remember uh, one of the first times that... Um, well, Kathy and I were still in the days of doing, doing a crafts fair, uh, and uh, there was one of the guys, very skilled at what he did, he was a wood turner, did uh, incredible bowls and stuff. Uh, he's got works in the uh, Honolulu Academy of Arts. I mean, he's a very talented guy, uh, Jewish guy, stockbroker, very intellectual guy, exactly the kind of guy I'd like to share my testimony with. Not. <laughs> and uh, very intimidating to, to me. I was a young guy at the time, like 25 years old. He's, and, uh, this guy's probably in his 40s, and, it's a, and he just flat out pretty much asked me about my Christian faith or heard about my Christian faith. It's like, 
oh baby, here we go. You know, but it's just amazing. It's not, it's not always uh, the way you think it's going to be. Uh, but I think it is almost always true, the more difficult the burden, the more difficult the trial, the more difficult the circumstances, in most cases, the greater the opportunity. Uh, it's really hard to get into a cancer ward and share your testimony with everybody there unless you have cancer. And they kind of let you in then. It's, it's very hard you know, to be on, on the uh, unemployment line with a bunch of guys and share your testimony unless you're unemployed. You know, God sometimes needs to get us to places we don't want to go to, but he's got a reason. He's got a purpose. Now, our whole issue is that could you just explain it all to me from the very beginning? You know, who and why? Tell me how it's all going to work out. But God doesn't do that. It's always, it's always my word is a, a, a light and, a, and it's a lamp. That means you get a few steps at a time. And, uh, and that's the way God works so often. And he says, hey, come on. Come on, just trust me here. Just trust me. And, uh, and we've got to be able to, like the Apostle Paul, uh, rely on God's word. And one of those words that Paul may have been relying on was Psalm 109. See if this, you don't think that uh, this fits Paul's situation. Uh, verses 1 to 4. Do not keep silent, O God, of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked, the mouth of the deceitful have opened up against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers. But I give myself to prayer. You know, the, you know we're, whoever we study, Job, Joseph, Joseph, Paul, whatever the circumstance, it's always, uh, is there a sense of God's presence? Uh, do I believe God has a plan? And can I hang on to his promises? And I would suggest if you're uh, in that place today where you need a couple of those, start in, in Romans 8. It starts out, there's no condemnation. It begins and nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Uh, and sandwiched between all these other wonderful promises uh, is all, uh, God works all things for good. Uh, there's just so much that uh, we don't understand. One of the hardest things is, is having uh, you know, something wrong with you physically and not knowing what it is. It's always encouraging the doc. Well, we're not really sure, but we're going to, you know, and then it's try this drug, try this test. You know, it, it'd be a lot easier. You know, if you, they just said, well, it's this. It's going to take two years for you to be healed. We're going to do this and this, and at the end of two years, it'll be fine. You know, actually, you could probably be able to go, okay, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, there, there is an outcome. I know what the end is. Uh, we just don't always know the end. Paul didn't really know the end. We know the end of the story, and we even know there was fruit from it. Uh, Paul doesn't, uh, but Paul is still trusting. He becomes this incredible example to us. I don't think he's worried about the future. Uh, I don't think he's concerned about uh, the new governor. Uh, I don't think uh, he's concerned about uh, Agrippa and, and Bernice uh, at all with the power that they held uh, over him. I think he looked at everything as a great opportunity that God had for him. And if he thought it up, he probably would have planned his ministry out a little differently. I think if it was Paul, he'd be in Spain by now. And then trying to, trying to get beyond that with the gospel. But God had a, a different plan and a different path for his life. We don't always understand. Uh, but along the way, if we're looking uh, and we're trusting, uh, God will use whatever difficulty we're facing for his glory and his good. He's got a plan. And... Uh, and uh, we, we may not always understand it, but we can always trust him uh, in the midst of it. Amen. Oh, our Lord. Oh, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Why don't we stand together? Oh,
You gave so free. 
strength to do what's right and to love.